Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll go into detail on Arizona's options regarding federal Medicaid funds. ASU pollster Bruce Merrill considers the vagaries of what is already shaping up as a crowded governor's race. And we'll look at a series of new art installations designed to embellish Sky Harbor's new Sky Train. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. A letter from the federal government is helping define the state's battle over Medicaid expansion. Here to talk about what the feds are saying and what options Arizona now faces is Mary Kay Reinhardt who's been covering the story for the Arizona Republic. Good to see you. Thanks for joining. Well, there's, there's so much going on here. Let's start with what exactly the feds said to Arizona last week. The feds issued a nine-page FAQ. It was actually in response to, to questions that multiple states have been asking. CMS isn't exactly a real quick on the response. You know? so, so there have been some questions sort of piling up. This one from Arizona, I think, dates back to late last year, where they asked, what if we wanted to continue to fund these childless adults with this waiver that we have that otherwise will expire at the end of the year, but we want to keep them capped. We want this, pro this enrollment to be capped. Would you think about maybe funding it the way you normally do, which is a two-to-one federal match? And the, the, in, in this long list of answers to questions that states have had, at the end of that list, they said to Arizona, not likely. Not, li not a no, definitely, not but a no, uh, a no otherwise. Right. We haven't formally asked them in a, what's called gotcha. a waiver, you know, we haven't made that that formal ask, but this was this was for the governor's purposes enough of a no to send a letter to legislator leaders saying, "See, this isn't going to happen. You're not going to get any money from the feds if you continue to freeze on this population." 2 to 1 match ends likely ends if the uh, the freeze uh, stays. Okay. So, uh, and this is something that we have to decide or should decide by the end of the year, correct? Because people will be falling off at the end of the year. That's th this program for yes. childless adults. This is pretty much who we're talking about. Right. People, people who don't have kids, um, who are zero to 100 percent of the poverty level, or zero to 133 if we expand. The, 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 the current program we have right now expires December 31st. That means it goes away. And the, the, the Affordable Care Act, the federal legislation, doesn't doesn't it sort of has this hole in it where these people then cannot go on the exchange to get their their needs met they they are sort of out there without anything if we don't expand at this point unless we 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 continue this program somehow on our own uh, were the people you talked to were they surprised uh, that the feds played a little hardball here i think some of the republicans who who oppose medicaid expansion were a bit surprised in the past uh, a couple of months they've said well the obama administration won't do this because it's basically the obama administration in their view you know saying no we're not going to fund these people. You're on your own. And so would they throw these people out, you know, a week after Christmas uh, to the wolves without health insurance? Well, it's the same argument that the governor's office and the, 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 the expansion proponents are using. We can't throw these people out. So legislature, you know, you have an, a moral obligation to, yes. to, to expand Medicaid so these people don't fall off. Because yes. they, without anything happening, with no one, if we did nothing, they indeed would fall off of the Medicaid rules uh, and have no insurance. Similar argument on either side right. of the scale. Right. Okay. And, and the governor took this uh, FAQ, this memo, this letter, whatever you want to call it here, and basically told lawmakers you have four options. There really, there seems to be five options, but let's, let's talk about the four the governor was talking about. First of all, you keep the freeze, okay, you keep the freeze at, at, at the level it is now, you don't expand it higher, um, cover the remaining childless adults. $850 million cost of the state, huh? Something along those lines? It's something along those lines. These are estimates. We just don't know how fast. If the freeze stays on, remember, the number of people that we cover gradually declines as it has from 220,000 when we put the freeze in place right to what something mm -hmm. like 85 now so we continue to see fewer and fewer people that we'd have to cover if we continue the freeze under that scenario but yeah they've costed it out in the 800 million dollar range who wants this anyone pushing for this the uh, conservative republicans in the legislature that's their sort of that's their, their plan. number one goal right there yeah, okay to continue the freeze and to fund it with state funds and and well, they'd prefer to have some federal funds in there too but if the feds say no they say we can go ahead and do it alone we have the um, rainy day fund it's about 450 million dollars we have a carry forward of somewhere in the 600 million dollar range so it's doable they say for at least three years to cover this population i, I know that some uh, conservatives as well though we're talking about just eliminating coverage for childless adults altogether which would cost the state uh, nothing zero as far as the general fund is concerned, but but you 
people would be just bouncing off this thing in mid-treatment, wouldn't they? Right. And you also have the little um, detail of voters approving <laughs> coverage for this population yes. twice. Yes. Um, so we did, uh, uh, in 2000, say we wanted this population to be covered under our Medicaid program. Anyone That's really pushing hard for this? I, you know, I don't think we're talking about throwing people off. In fact, even the, you know, the most conservative uh, uh, Republicans' opponents of expansion are saying we're not going to throw people off. Um, who are, you know, the people that are in mid-treatment for cancer, people who are on dialysis, people who are with serious mental illness, they, I don't think there's any support for doing that. Okay, third option, you end the freeze, which reinstates the two-to-one federal match, and yet costs the state a lot of money over the next three years. Right, and you still have to get a separate approval to to, to cover those people exactly. if you're not going to cover them all the way to the 133, which is what the Obama administration wants us to do. Under Who wants that aspect? Anyone want that one? Not too mm, much? Not too much. I don't all think right. we're talking too much, but it's a lot of money. And, um, yeah, I don't it's think like that's $1.3 right. That's a lot. Okay, let's talk about the fourth option, which is the governor's plan, the one that she's uh, uh, pursuing, and that is you pay for expansion with a hospital assessment, mm -hmm. and that brings in a lot of money. It brings in a lot of federal money. Yes. And, um, a little bit more for the, right, it does. And it, and it um, actually is a net gain to the state um, and because the, the hospitals, you know, the, the hospital assessment brings in more than we actually need for our increased share. The state, when you insure more people, it costs more money. Right. And so it'll cost, the feds are going to pay for about 90 to 100 percent of that um, up in, you know, for the foreseeable future. That's, that's a, that's a, um, uh, in the Affordable Care Act, that's in the legislation, but the, the hospital assessment that the governor has put into her proposal is, is really sort of a, a, a way to say, see, we won't have to actually spend more money right. because the, the hospitals who have been taking care of an increasing number of uninsured patients are willing to tax themselves to draw down even more federal money, netting about $100 million for the state general fund. Indeed, and not, not only netting $100 million for the general fund, but, but receive eight billion dollars in federal funds over the next three years and that's why the governor and those who support this say there really is no choice that is your choice that's what they say yes um, is that gaining traction well <laughs> that's the sixty four thousand dollar question it certainly has traction among democrats support and have been supportive of the governor's plan um, and a handful of republicans um, in both chambers so there have been pretty consistently enough votes in the senate uh, for a simple majority, and in the House, close, probably also a simple majority. Um, there are a very, you know, strong group of vocal conservative Republicans in the legislature, not the least of which is the President of the Senate and the House Speaker, um, who decide, what, you know, what bills get heard, um, who, and, and many others, um, frankly, who don't believe, A, that the federal money is going to last, that this is a sustainable program. And so they don't think this money is going to be there. They think we're going to end up insuring all these people and then get stuck with the bill. Right. Um, they also don't think it's the right thing to do in the midst of a significant federal deficit. That that $8 billion you talk about is not free money, mm -hmm. it's our money. We don't want to make the deficit worse than it already is, and so we're going to do our part to, um, to not make the deficit worse than it is. Let's go to the fifth option the governor did not mention, and that is just referring this thing to the ballot. How much traction is that getting? It's getting a little more the later we get into the <laughs> session. It's beginning, you hear more and more people talking about it. Um, it is, um, an option some of us who've been around for a few years remember from 2009. That's how we got out of the one cent sales tax um, debacle, fiasco, how, whatever you want to call 17 special sessions in a row or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, it is a way out. Um, now, Senator, uh, Senate President Andy Biggs has said, I won't do it. It's abdicating our responsibility as a legislature. We, you know, we must do the, the job that we were sent here to do. But that's what Bob Burns, who was the Senate president at the time of Prop 100, the, the one cent sales tax, you know, felt at the time, too. And it, so a lot of things can happen and probably will in the next couple of months. But that is an option more people are talking about. Will that get to a ballot? I mean, could there be a special election in sure. time to save those folks who would drop off at the end of the year? More research is needed on yes, that issue. Yes. But if you recall, in, in uh, 2009, they, it took them, um, I think, until early 2010 to get that on the ballot. We voted on it in May. So, so so certainly the Secretary of State needs some lead time, a matter of mo weeks and months, to, to make it happen. A, a statewide election isn't just, you know, a drop of a hat. Right. But, but um, there could also be sort of a bridge put in place if they wanted to put it on the ballot. Let's say it couldn't get on until May. Maybe you, maybe you pay for those folks until, and keep them on, to, to keep them on insurance until the election is held. All right. Wow. Good stuff. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thank us. You.
The 2014 governor's race is already heating up with numerous candidates and near candidates declaring a desire to run. Arizona State University pollster Bruce Merrill is here to talk about what could be quite a campaign. I mean, uh, this is really shaping up uh, quite well, isn't it? It is, and, and believe it or not, it's getting late. It's only 18 months <laughs> to the yes. election. It takes uh, that long to put together a really successful campaign in a major statewide election. So the election isn't that far off. Let's start with Andy Thomas. I think that's got most uh, tongues wagging right now. Surprised that he made this announcement? Well, uh, I'm not surprised or not surprised. It, uh, you know, he can get clean election money and use that money to uh, further his agenda. And uh, in my opinion, I don't think he has a great chance to be successful in the primary. Uh, but he certainly could affect the outcome of the primary depending upon how many people end up being in the race and, and how that vote is decided. How much could he disrupt a primary? Let's say there are, are not too many candidates. Let's say there's a whole boatload of them. How does he, how does he affect things? <clears throat> well, the key thing right now is uh, I think there could be seven, eight candidates on the Republican side. And uh, it really gets down, remember the turnout in a primary in Arizona is quite low, let's say 30, 35 percent at most. And it really is going to depend on more than anything, and Andy Thomas is one of those people, how many right-wingers or conservatives get involved. The more right-wing candidates you have, the more they divide that vote, which allows somebody like a Hugh Holman or a Scott Smith or... Uh, uh, you know, a more moderate candidate to actually uh, s uh, sneak through the primary. Where would a Ken Bennett fall on that grid? Well, uh, you know, I don't like those terms anymore, conservative or, or, or liberal. He certainly has had, uh, because of some of his positions on where Obama was born and some other things, uh, uh, a lot of impact with the so-called Tea Partiers, and, and that would kind of put him at least towards the right end of the spectrum as we normally talk about it. Does, uh, back to Andy Thomas, does he have enough name recognition around the state? Does he have enough time to barnstorm and raise that name recognition? Well, it, uh, he has more than most, uh, that's for sure. And, and keep in mind that it's only in Maricopa County because he was this county uh, attorney. But the thing is, 70% of the votes in Maricopa County now. Mm -hmm. So that's why you don't hear a, a lot, even with some of the gubernatorial candidates, about people from Tucson or other parts of the state. So let's say that, uh, last thing on Thomas, <laughs> his announcement, does that mean anyone who may have been thinking may be thinking twice or vice versa? <clears throat> no, I don't think so. I, I think it's uh, it's kind of hard to know how he he certainly will have his supporters. Uh, he was very vociferous for a long time. He and Joe Arpaio were best buddies. Uh, but he is a disbarred attorney, and he's been disgraced in many respects, and, and so he may have a hard time overcoming that. Uh, but the, the interesting th thing, Ted, is you, you raise an interesting point. Uh, one of the people that will be most influential, in my opinion, of who gets the nomination is who gets Joe Arpaio's endorsement. Even now? Even now. I mean, uh, a lot of people don't like Joe, but I want to tell you the people that have a high probability of voting, the older retired people in Sun City, Sun City West, the East Valley, they like Joe a lot. And uh, that's why during presidential election primaries, every one of the candidates wanted Joe's endorsement. Let's go over to the Democratic side. Sure. Fred Duvall has made his announcement. I think a lot of folks are expecting uh, Chad Campbell, the House Minority Leader, to do likewise, although he hasn't yet. Uh, shape that up for us. How viable a can First of all, the primary, and then either one of these guys in the general. Well, I, I think you've raised two questions. There will be fewer people uh, on the Democratic side. There's fewer Democrats. They haven't competed effectively at that level uh, for some time. There's no big-name person. Uh, I think Fred DeWall is an extremely bright person. He's uh, uh, certainly got uh, qualifications in education with the board. Uh, the question on him, is he tough enough? Uh, and I have people ask me that. You know, I like him. He's bright. Is he going to be tough enough to take on somebody? Uh, Chad might be tougher. Uh, he's kind of been in the crucible in the legislature, and it's hard to say. But keep in mind the other factor whether it's with these two candidates on the Democratic side and to some degree the Republican side, it's going to take a lot of money 
Uh, keep in mind, Cardin spent $10 million running a primary for a statewide race for the Senate. Uh, the governor's race is similar. In my opinion, it's going to take a minimum of 3 to $5 million for a successful candidate to come out of the primary. It sounds like that would hurt on the Republican side, maybe a Melvin um, or a Christine Jones, I don't know, regarding the business community, if she should decide to run. Who does it help on the Republican side, and who would it help, do you think, on the Democratic side? Well, uh, it, it certainly helps uh, somebody like a Doug Ducey, a very successful businessman, uh, Ken Bennett. Uh, and the other thing about both Ken Bennett and Doug Ducey is they both have the advantages of name recognition because they ran statewide races. Mm -hmm. And uh, they both have the resources, I think, more than most candidates to fund a campaign. Uh, but there's no question money has become a, a, a much more important player. Duvall or Campbell on the Democratic side, capable of raising more money? I really don't know. Hard to say, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's hard to say. Uh, on the back to the Republican side, we hear a lot about Scott Smith, mayor of Mesa, as being he, he was such a dark horse candidate for so long that he's, he's lightening up a little bit because everyone's got him as a dark horse candidate. Um, how does he fit in all this? Well, if you talk with people about Scott, they really like him. He's done a great job in Mesa, and that's a tough place over there. They've been down economically for a long time. Uh, he's a moderate, and uh, his chance, he would have a lot better chance as a Republican candidate in the general election if he can get out of the primary than he's going to have. Uh, he's going to have a tough time in the primary. I don't think there's much doubt. Overall, both primaries and general, impact of Latino vote to the changing demographics of Arizona? Uh, increasingly important. And, and we really saw this. Uh, uh, there was a lot of energy that came out of the DREAM Act people in Arizona. The more exciting thing with the Hispanics wasn't the traditional Hispanics. It was these young people. And uh, I think you're going to see the Hispanics have more and more of a role in the Democratic side. And real quickly, mid-year elections impact there? Oh, listen, uh, you hate to see the politics, but there's no question that the Democrats and Obama, the more havoc, the more uh, crisis that they can create in terms of the legislature is going to allow them to go out into the legislative or congressional districts and say, I need you in Washington, vote Democratic so that we can get rid of these Republicans in the House. Interesting. All right, Bruce, always a pleasure. Good always to have a you. pleasure. Thank you, sir. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. The new SkyTrain to Sky Harbor began operations earlier this month. The debut included an art opening of sorts with the presentation of nearly half a dozen art installations designed to coincide with the train. I talked to City of Phoenix Public Art Program Director Ed Lebo about the installations. It's good to have you here. Delighted to be here. Uh, what are we talking about? We've got f uh, five artists, six and what, what is happening? Five artists and artist teams and six installations at each of the new sites and stops along the SkyTrain. And how long in development was this? You know, uh, Ann Coe, one of the artists, likes to say that her project manager was pregnant when they started, and now she has a five-year-old. So it's uh, right. since 2008. And where exactly is this art displayed? Is it, is it on the train, in the train, around the train? It's the spaces leading up to the train. Uh, there are floors, huge terrazzo floors at the station platforms. If you get off on light rail to cross uh, 44th Street, cross a bridge, that entire bridge is designed by an artist uh, working with the design team of architects and engineers and all the rest. East Economy Lot and then Terminal 4, you have two major projects there. Well, let's take a look at some of these projects and starting with this, this one with, a, is it Daniel Mayer? Daniel Mayer. Uh, embedding letters on the floor. It's kind of like a calligraphy here, right? It is. Well, Daniel Mayer is a bookmaker and a printmaker who teaches out at ASU, and so he uses a lot of fonts, as we like to call in the digital world. And uh, in this case, he wanted to scatter the floor with a path that led you from one part of the train, the exit to the train, right over to the elevators and escalators. And the scrawl that you have there is, um, you know, limitless is the open and uh, timeless is the open, sort of to draw upon the book of travel. Isn't that interesting? And Daniel Mayer also now did, I believe, a couple of glass murals as well. He, where, where are these? He sure did. When you come off of the SkyTrain platform at Terminal 4, you go down the escalators, and there are two bridges that connect the train station to the terminal. He did these remarkable murals that were 
really began with prints of Arizona leaves on aluminum foil. And then he scaled these up and produced them uh, in traditional stained glass technique for both of these bridges, and they're beautiful and large. And in fact, you can see these uh, from the drop-off area down below at Terminal 4 wow. on the south side. It must be very, basically those are leaf prints, aren't those they? Those are leaf prints and uh, very traditional, but in a contemporary setting unlike any other. And I would imagine the scope and size kind of takes your breath away a little bit when you first see them. 115 feet long by about 9 My feet high, goodness. so you feel like you're a bug crawling on the leaf. Uh, Daniel Martin Diaz uh, had actually did a floor at the pedestrian bridge. What was this one all about? About. Daniel Martin Diaz did a remarkable floor at the pedestrian bridge from 44th Street uh, Station over to the 44th Street uh, light rail stop. This is a remarkable project. It's almost 500 feet long, 40 feet wide, and you can see from some of these pictures the kind of hand craftsmanship that went into this. These were produced right here in Phoenix by Advanced Terrazzo and some of their skilled craftsmen. Each nice. floor took about 25 workers. And this is an ancient technique. Terrazzo is something that dates back a couple thousand years. It began with bits of marble from construction and built into cement. Now we have modern materials that are oh, really just, beautiful. That's absolutely gorgeous, mandala-like up there. Um, and Co uh, so, excuse me, Fausto Fernandez and Ann Co. both. But let's start with Fausto Fernandez, well known in the valley as an artist. You got him to contribute as well, huh? We did. We had a competition to select these artists five years ago. And Fausto, Daniel Mayer, and Daniel Martin Diaz, and Ann Coe became the artists to do the Terrazzo projects. Fausto, because of his beautiful layering of paintings uh, and his imagery, got this uh, project. And he worked really beautifully with the design team to create a, a pattern that's based on tailplane wings. Uh, indeed, and it's yeah. absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Ann Coe, again, another very familiar artist uh, to folks here in the valley, and uh, she did a floor as well? She did a floor, and it, it captures all of the whimsy that everybody knows Ann has, and so it's uh, essentially an aerial flyover of the, uh, the Arizona landscape, which she loves, and so you have these wiggling lines of tree or canals and rivers and takes off the topographic map yes, uh, yes. graphics that you often see. A floor as landscape. Floor as landscape and the one thing I'd point out is that at the East Economy lot this is an outdoor station Interesting. so Advance had to come up with uh, an innovative new product to uh, make it a durable product in the outdoors. It's and there was an project. international team as well that did this now this was was this a ceiling of cloud something along these lines? Yep at the 44th Street station on the ground floor sort of the main entrance to the uh, that site uh, you have the international team of uh, Mario Mareg, uh, Michael Parakahai working with Paul Deeb and uh, they had done a good deal of reading about the ancient ocean that used to be here covering Arizona, and they also just were infatuated with the blueness of our sky yes. and the landscape. So they combined those two things into this grid that has this rippling like water in the middle. We don't have too much time left. These artists, how much control, how much say did they have over what they wanted to do? Very significant. They began with drawings and then worked directly with the architectural team to tweak them and incorporate them right into the plans as the entire SkyTrain developed. And the overall cost of all this? About $5.6 million and change out of a $1.5 billion dollar project. And, and again, the money came from? Percent for Art program. The city has a percent for art program, which means a penny out of every buck the city spends on building itself involves artists and coming up with these kinds of enhancements. And real quickly, the response from the artists, they happy? They are delighted, thrilled, and the response from the public has been Goodness gracious, this is wonderful, wonderful work. Well, uh, congratulations on a success there. Can't wait to get out there and take a look. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you it. very much for having me on. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. And tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, a debate on the merits of labor contracts that allow Phoenix police to perform union activities during work hours. And we'll hear about ASU TGen and the Mayo Clinic collaborating to fight breast cancer. That's Tuesday evening, 5.30 and 10, here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.
Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.